Good day. The last couple of hours um, in terms of the conflict of, in Ukraine have been somewhat quieter in terms of battles on the front lines, or at least information about the battles on the front lines. The two are not exactly the same. Lots may be happening, but information may be sparse. But I'm going to suggest that we do have a certain amount of clarity about what has been going on. Firstly, let's talk about the area around Artyomovsk, the former Bakhmut. Um, over the last couple of days, I've been saying that it seems as if it is indeed the Russians who are on the attack in that area. And there have been reports appearing in the Russian media suggesting that the Russians have been attacking Ivanivska and maybe trying to capture this important village near to, uh, near to Artyomovsk. Um, I think we have now had some more clarification about this. It seems that these Russian attacks have not been pressed home with any particular intensity. In fact, what the Russians have been doing is methodically retaking air territory um, captured, that's the right word, by Ukraine in its recent counterattack in the Battle of Bakhmut, um, especially in the north, in the area around the uh, Berehova uh, Reservoir and wherever. In other words, this is not yet a general offensive, it's more a tidying up operation with the Russians apparently still concerned um, that Ukraine might at some point attempt a counterattack um, towards Bakhmut. Um, and the Russians want to make sure that if they do that over the next couple of days or weeks, what Simplicius the thinker called the crumple zones are back under Russian control. And it seems that all of these places, or most of these places, or many of these places, have indeed been recaptured. We're talking here not about villages or settlements, we're talking more about open fields, hills, um, referred to by some people as high ground. But let me repeat again um, that Slavyangrad did a detailed analysis of this topic of the high ground in and around Bakhmut, Artyomovsk, and concluded that this is a misconception, that the area is essentially flat, that when people talk about high ground, they, these are undulating um, features in the landscape. We're not talking about hills or <laughs> peaks, which could indeed form the kind of um, defensive positions that some people imagine. So I think that there's been some misunderstanding about this in some of the recent discussions when some of these features were taken by the Ukrainians during their counterattack. Some people thought that this might be important. It proved that it was not important precisely because the analysis that Slavyangrad gave was correct. These are not high places from which you can plant, place artillery and observation devices and shell positions on the low ground. It isn't really like that in this part of, in this part of the battlefield. So anyway, the Russians have been quietly retaking these places. No doubt they have been launching attacks on Ivanivska, but if so, these are probably more intended to pin the Ukrainians down there. Whilst I'm on the topic of Artyomovsk and the areas around about, I ought to say that there has still been no formal acknowledgement from the Ukrainian military that the town has fallen and is indeed under Russian control. There's not even been a proper acceptance of this, at least in the British media, even though you do get a number of British commentaries and reports and discussions that Bakhmut has indeed been captured by the Russians. I don't think the British Ministry of Defence, for example, has so far acknowledged this fact. I might be wrong. I'm not fully up to date at present with all its bulletins, most of which, frankly, are not very helpful in trying to understand the battle. One person 
from the Ukrainian side who has been in the area is Yuri Lutsenko, former Procurator General of Ukraine, Attorney General if you prefer, a person who played a not inconsiderable role in Donald Trump's first impeachment proceedings. I'm not going to waste time <laughs> discussing those. Anyway, Lutsenko has been to the area. He's appeared in the mandatory flak jacket and helmet. Um, he has spoken about the situation on the front lines as if Bakhmut has indeed fallen, which it has. He says that it is behind him, that he makes it fairly clear that it is under Russian control. Um, he says that new front lines have been created. And he says that Bakhmut did its job, did its job presumably to grind the Russian army down. It's very interesting um, that in response to this battle, Ukraine and its Western sponsors effectively flipped the, flipped the script. We know because various Russian officials, including Prigozhin, but also General Surovikin back in October, essentially told us that the primary purpose of the battle of Bakhmut was not so much the capture of the place itself as to grind the Ukrainians down. In fact, the official title of this operation on the Russian side was Operation Bakhmut Meat Grinder to draw Ukrainian troops into Bakhmut to um, kill or wound or render inoperable as many of them as possible, to go on doing this week after week, month after month, re reducing the combat effectiveness of the Ukrainian army, buying the Russians time, time to uh, train their reservists called up in September, time to build up their fortifications across the um, lines, trying, time to re-equip, time to get their military industries cranked up and working at full capacity. And that is what the Russians did. But the Ukrainians and the Western powers at some point decided to flip the script, pretend that the purpose of the Battle of Bakhmut, which Ukraine was defending at such an enormous price, was on the contrary to grind the Russians down. And I think that this started to happen around January, February, when it became clear that um, Bakhmut would eventually be captured by the Russians and would become Artyomovsk. And um, when Western leaders and officials and Ukrainian officials started to become alarmed at the extent of Ukrainian losses. And there was a um, report, as I remember, I think back in February by the German intelligence agency, the BND, which was expressing alarm at the extent of Ukrainian casualties in Bakhmut, that they were in three figures every day. And it was at around that time, as I remember, that, as I said, the flip, the, the script was flipped. We should not let ourselves be deceived by this. Every single indication I have seen suggests that, on the, that it was, in fact, the Ukrainians who were bled white at Bakhmut, who suffered the terrible losses in men and, to some extent, in equipment, and who ultimately failed in Bakhmut, whilst the Russians succeeded. I would also add that, to some extent, the Western script has got fudged by the way in which people in the West have spoken about the Wagner organisation. It's been described as made up essentially of conscripts, that this is a conscript force with conscripts rounded up, thrown into the battle, without much training, without any real planning, killed in the thousands, and nonetheless, this force of conscripts 
was able, of convicts rather, was able to capture Bakhmut. Well, if that were so, then I have to say that it still seems to me that the Russians have rather cynically and brutally, in that case, traded lives in Bakhmut to their advantage. They got rid of disposable convicts and killed many of Ukraine's best troops and captured the town and weakened Ukraine without their regular army supposedly being involved. Needless to say, this is not the case at all. Now, there's been much reporting and discussion about the Battle of Bakhmut from people who are much more involved and interested in this affair than I am. Douglas McGregor, as I've discussed previously, has had an interesting piece about it um, on the American Conservative, which I read from in one of my recent videos. He's also discussed the Battle of Bakhmut in uh, various um, of his videos, which you can also find. And I can remember, by the way, that way back weeks ago, in a long conversation he had with Michael Vlachos, he was already saying that the Russians had drawn the Ukrainians into a trap at Bakhmut, that Bakhmut was working to Russia's advantage as part of the battle of attrition that the Russians were fighting there. So that was that's Douglas McGregor. Brian Belletic has also discussed and spoken about Bakhmut very intelligently and very presciently. He's also explained the nature of the battle there and how it's been fought by the Russians and how it fits well into the strategy of attrition that the Russians have been pursuing. And we've had good pieces by Simplicius the Thinker. And there's also been a very fine piece today by somebody called Olympus, which has, which has appeared on the Slavyangrad Telegram channel. Now, I should say that Olympus goes into great length about many things. I don't always agree with his analysis. But I think on the Battle of Bakhmut, he's got it about right. He says that the function, the primary function of the Wagner forces was to clear ground, which had already been shelled or bombed in the battle, in the actual fighting, in the fighting in the town itself, by the regular Russian army's artillery forces and by the Russian air force. Certainly, there was some very intense hand-to-hand -hand fighting as these buildings were cleared and as the... Wagner forces pressed forward and he also makes the absolutely correct point that towards the end of the battle Russian tanks increasingly started to play a significant role in the battle they were also physically present in Bakhmut um, Ukraine was complaining about them and about the fact that they were launching direct fire on Ukrainian positions um, we've not been told who operated those tanks, but it's clear now that it was the Russian regular army. And I have previously speculated that it was almost certainly that there was most likely uh, naval infantry, Marines, in other words, of the Russian um, fleet, who are often used by the Russians to conduct um, urban fighting, street fighting, in which it seems they are partly trained. But anyway, that's one point that Olympus has made. He's also made a second point, which I think is a very important one and corresponds very much with my own understanding of the battle and with my previous commentary, which is that until roughly March, the Russians were content to allow Ukraine to continue to hold Bakhmut because the primary purpose was not to capture Bakhmut, but to grind Ukrainian forces down there. And the, the objective, therefore, was to take the surrounding villages, put Bakhmut in a kind of semicircle, 
which was basically achieved by the end of February, let the Ukrainians continue to send troops in. That was why no attempt was made to close the pincers around Bakhmut, no attempt was made to capture Khromovo and Ivanivska, serious attempt was made to capture Khromovo and Ivanivska. Prigozhin confirmed that the Russian military made a decision not to do that. The idea was to let Ukraine continue to funnel troops into Bakhmut so that they could be destroyed there. And Olympus makes the valid point that this was done principally with artillery and bombs. In other words, that was what caused the greatest number of Ukrainian casualties in the fighting. However, I think he is also correct in saying that sometime, perhaps towards the end of March, early April, a decision was made that, va that um, this Operation Bakhmut Meat Grinder had reached its logical end point. There was no further purpose in keeping it going for much longer. And the decision was made to finally capture the town. And that happened in intense street fighting, which took place over the course of April and May, right up to the 20th of May, with, as I said, the Wagner forces at all times backed by Russian regular army, artillery and aircraft. So that, I think, is a good summary of the Battle of Bachmann. Now, Olympus discusses many other things. He talks about the fact that the Russians have built up huge forces. He puts the number of Russian forces, or rather he gives a number for the, Rus for the Russian forces at 800,000 which I strongly suspect is too high, but never mind. He talks about the fact that layered defences and fortifications have been built up. He also talks about the fact that the Russian air defence system is now functioning um, at very high levels of efficiency, higher than was the case at the early parts of the war. And that is true, and I'm going to touch on that shortly. Um, anyway, he says that the Russians are now waiting for this Ukrainian counterattack, and once it's over, he too appears to expect that the Russians will launch a big counteroffensive, that these huge forces that have been assembled will not be left idle. They will push forward, and that this will then lead to perhaps the decisive break of the forces of Ukraine. Now, as to that, I do want to add a word of caution. The only Russian commander who I know who has discussed the course of the war is the uh, very talented and um, logical Apti Alaudinov, as his name suggests, by ethnicity a Chechen. He says that the Russians do not intend to launch any big arrow offensives, even after the Ukrainian offensive has been repelled. They will continue with their grinding, attritional approach to the war, which has worked to their advantage up to this point. And he guesstimated that this would eventually lead to a Ukrainian collapse around August or September of next year. And I have to repeat again, reiterate it again, he is the only Russian commander who has given any insight at all into Russian plans. Now, it may be that he's simply expressing his opinion. He is not an individual connected to the Russian general staff in Moscow. Um, but I'm sure that he has had discussions with people like Gerasimov and Surovikin and the others, and perhaps he has a better understanding of what they're thinking than the rest of us do. Um, against that, I should say 
the, the source that I've been in touch with, who has been in contact with me, who is in close contact with people within the Wagner organisation, and has satisfied me that he is indeed in close touch with those people. He tells me that the mood in the Russian army amongst the soldiers is that the time has come for them to go on the offensive, that they accept and understand that they have to deal with the counter-offensive counter first, that they've, they've now reached that point where they feel collectively that the point has now come when they must take the battle to the Ukrainians. This is very much their desire, and um, commanders, presumably, um, general staff commanders are presumably aware of this sentiment amongst the troops. I, of course, only have one source, and it's an indirect source, is proof that this is the feeling amongst the troops. But anyway, the general staff officers probably do know that this is the sentiment amongst the troops, and it might be something that they take into account when they decide what to do when the offensive, the Ukrainian offensive, is done, is done with and out of the way. Now, saying all of this brings me back to the topic of how many Ukrainian soldiers were killed in the Battle of Bakhmut in, over the course of Operation Bakhmut Meat Grinder. Now, Prigozhin claimed that 50,000 Ukrainian soldiers were killed in the battle. Um, left, uh, a, a Russian military expert from the Lugansk People's Republic, a Colonel Vitaly Kiselyov, perhaps a rather more, um, a source perhaps more closely connected to the Russian high command, puts the number at less than that. He says that between 35 to 40,000 um, are the irretrievable losses that Ukraine suffered in the battles of Solidar and Artyomovsk. 35 to 40,000 means dead and so severely wounded that they're no longer able to participate in the battle. I think that this is actually a more authoritative piece of information than what we've got from um, Prigozhin. That's just my feeling. Um, it would suggest if we if we allow that Prigozhin's number of five thousand Wagner troops having been killed in the fighting is correct. Well. That gives us a ratio of around eight to one in terms of combat soldiers, or seven to eight to one, which is in line with what the Russians have suggested at various times is the relative ratio of Ukrainian to Russian combat losses. Now, that doesn't take into account the numbers of dead uh, convicts, which you, Prigozhin has put at 10,000, and so has Gen John Kirby. Um, but I don't place much credence on that number. And a number of people have pointed out that it is, in fact, in Prigozhin's interests to inflate casualties, both Ukrainian and, to some extent, his own. Anyway, I'm going to leave this topic at that. So, in Bakhmut, in the area around Artyomovsk, um, we're not yet seeing any big Russian offensives, any big Russian offensives or Ukrainian offensives for that matter, but the Russians have been quietly recapturing territory that Ukraine occupied as part of its counterattack. It seems that in some places, Ukraine simply pulled back, pulled its forces back. Um, there is no further point in trying to cling on to these open fields, exposing their troops to heavy artillery fire from the Russian artillery, um, suffering more losses 
they pulled back to their lines and they're now trying to create a new defence line through Ivanivska and presumably ultimately Charsov Yar. As I've discussed before, Ivanivska is the tougher obstacle, but once the Russians have completed their various redeployments in the area, once the Wagner forces are fully replaced by regular Russian army troops, I suspect that at some point the Russians will press west. And they'll no doubt take Ivanivska, which, however well fortified it is and protected by its surrounding woods, can presumably now be circumvented, given that Bakhmut itself has fallen and that the Russians could push northward through the Khromovo road towards Chasov Yar, which could presumably turn the position around um, Ivanivska. And anyway, the ultimate intention, I suspect, of the Russians here will at some point be to take Chasov Yar and then perhaps push further west to Konstantinovka, a rather bigger place. And by the way, the place where General Sirsky seems to have had his command post during the Battle of Bakhmut and then perhaps push further west still after the lines have been consolidated and there's been a further redeployment eventually towards Kramatorsk, which must be the ultimate prize. Anyway, that's enough about Bakhmut. Elsewhere, it does seem that the Russians um, are launching rather more serious offensives and it seems there's been a significant uh, push by the Russians in the Avdeevka area. I think the Russians probably, as I've discussed already, are using Avdeevka as a kind of secondary meat grinder. But the fact that they're now acting to cut roads into Avdeevka, as shown by their, that destruction of that bridge and dam that I discussed yesterday, suggests that at some point, at some level, they may have decided that the time has come to end the battle of Avdeevka as well, to capture Avdeevka too. Doing so will have a significant effect on morale in Donetsk city. Most of the artillery strikes that Ukraine launches on, on Donetsk city take place from Avdeevka. And further north along the Oskol River, the Russians who cap uh, captured a bridgehead across the Oskol River about 10 days ago, apparently they still hold that bridgehead and they have been quietly enlarging the area that they control on the east bank of the Oskol River as well. Now the Oskol River is the river that runs through Kupiansk. Um, to the west lies Izium, which the Russians captured in March last year, but which the Ukrainians recaptured in September. Um, once was called the gateway to the Donbass, which is, I suspect, why the Russians captured it. I think they thought that capturing Izium would close off Ukrainian communications to Donbass. They were rapidly disabused of that idea. But it does seem as if the Russians are now strengthening their positions along the Oskol River line. They're very close to Kupiansk. They got there some weeks ago. They've not made any serious attempts so far to recapture Kupiansk, but one senses again that the Russians are, if you like to use that expression, shaping the battlefield in preparation for further advances at some point in the future. So events there, Avdeevka and Kupiansk, and along the Oskol River, and further south around Sivesk, which I strongly suspect will be an important Russian target, perhaps within the next few weeks, perhaps within the next few days. I have no idea one way or the other. And the Russians also claim, by the way, that they've disrupted Ukrainian attempts to rotate their troops in Vugledar and in Marinka. I've come to the conclusion that the fight for Marinka is very similar 
to the fight for Bakhmut. The Russians have been using the fight for Marinka less to capture the place, more to grind the Ukrainian troops, the Ukrainians down, by allowing the Ukrainians to hold on to some buildings on its western edge, which the Russians can then systematically shell and bomb at their leisure. Pictures from Marinka, lots of pictures and films from Marinka, show a city that has been utterly devastated, leveled to an extent that I have not seen up to now in this war. The damage in Marinka is far worse than say it was than it was say in Mariupol or in Artyomsk, and that says something. So anyway, that's the situation on the battle lines. Now I mean lots of rumors, many stories about the Ukrainian counteroffensive. And I've seen some more reports now. There's been a whole cluster of reports in The Economist, The Daily Telegraph, parts of the American media too, about how fires on the contact line show that Ukraine is launching lots of artillery and missile strikes in, um, and that this is a strong indicator that the Ukrainian counteroffensive is about to happen. And there's also been talk that the weather conditions are now optimal, that the counteroffensive should be, might be ready at any point in time. Um, one of Zelensky's advisors, I think it was Podolyak, um, was put through a BBC interview in which he was basically pushed to say when the offensive would happen, and he said it might happen today, tomorrow, in a week's time, that it was a one-off thing, it has to succeed, he said, but, you know, that it's coming very, very soon. And all of this reflects now relentless pressure from the West upon Ukraine to get this offensive going. And the Russians, by the way, have picked up on this. There's been a, a comment from a Russian deputy foreign minister, Mikhail Galuzin, and he, he gave today an interview to the to the Russian, the official Russian news agency TASS. He says the fact that the that the West is actively pushing Ukraine to launch this counteroffensive, in spite of all the risks of its catastrophic consequences for the country and its residents, yet again vividly demonstrates that the Kiev regime's handlers and Vladimir Zelensky himself are absolutely indifferent to their fate and that they firmly intend to continue the conflict with Russia until the last Ukrainian. And there's no doubt at all that there is this pressure. These commentaries, you know, talk about the fires that people can see through the satellites. I'm not saying they're not happening, by the way. The talk about the weather conditions being optimal, the statements about Ukraine having been provided, supplied with all the weapons it needs to conduct with this offensive, the claims that appeared a short time ago, I think it was in the Financial Times, that the West has managed to cobble together the ammunition, the levels of ammunition that Ukraine needs for this offensive, to sustain this offensive. All of this has to be understood as enormous pressure on Ukraine to launch this counteroffensive. And um, we had reports some weeks ago that the US government, the top officials in the Biden administration, uh, Jake Sullivan and the others, basically gave Ukraine a kind of ultimatum. They said either launch this counteroffensive, or if you're not prepared to launch this counteroffensive, sit down and negotiate with the Russians. We, in effect, are going to wash our hands of you. Because, of course, Jake Sullivan, the Biden team, all of them know that for the moment, Ukraine is boxed in. It cannot negotiate with the Russians. There was an article about that 
in the London Times that I discussed some weeks ago that for Zelensky and his officials to sit down and engage the Russians in negotiations would be, well, political suicide for them, given the expectations they've created in Ukraine, and given also the extreme pressure they're coming under from hardliners like Budanov and the various uh, militias and ideologically driven military units that Budanov can presumably call upon. So Jake Sullivan, people like that telling Ukraine to sit down and negotiate is in effect, if they don't want to launch the effective, is in effect a piece of blackmail. It's telling Ukraine, look, these are your options. Either you launch this offensive or we wash our hands of you. And of course, we've now had a succession of statements from people like De Director of National Intelligence Haynes, German Defense Minister Historius, um, Josep Borrell, all of them saying, without our help, without our support, Ukraine would collapse within days. The last, quite probably, is true. Well, not within days, but it would certainly fall apart fairly fast. But again, people are not, I think, understanding what is actually going on. This is, in effect, blackmailing Ukraine, forcing Ukraine to push forward with this offensive, despite the obvious unease and reluctance of Ukraine's own military leaders, Sierski and Zeluzhny, and despite Zelensky's own very obvious doubts, um, with threats of a cut-off of aid, if they don't, in the full knowledge that the option, the alternative option, would be a political crisis in Kiev, which all of these people would not survive. So it's, frankly, very godfatherish behaviour. And I think it's something that people perhaps do need to take into account. That brings me back to the question of why. Why is the United States, why are the West pushing Ukraine into this counteroffensive? Now, there's lots of uncertainties about this counteroffensive, but I've now been reading lots of reports about the number of troops that will be committed to this counteroffensive. And Western commentaries, these are Western commentaries, put the number of Western trained troops who are going to be the spearhead at around 30,000. And they will launch this offensive with something like 250 tanks, of which around 60 or 70 are Western tanks, Leopard 2s, Challengers 2s. People talk about them as modern tanks, but they're not that modern. And I've discussed the compatibility issues. It turns out, by the way, which is something I didn't know, and perhaps people can either correct or confirm that the 120 millimeter guns that are operated by Leopard 2s, well, different Leopard 2s operate different versions of these guns. And some of the shells that the later gun can fire can't be fired by the guns operated, the earlier guns operated by earlier Leopard 2. So I, I'm not going to get into any of this. So anyway, um, around, as we said, 250 tanks, around 100 Bradleys, around 100 Strikers, around 40 Marders, though Germany says it's going to increase that number that we don't know how, how much or how soon. It doesn't really look like a particularly powerful, potent force. And of course, in the meantime, the Russians have been acting to degrade it. We've had 
missile and bomb strikes all over the place. They were again, Russians were again busy with missile and bomb strikes across Ukraine. Yesterday, there was reports there was a particularly severe attack on the town of Orekhov in Zaporozhye. This is a town that the Russians approached in the fighting in January. Some people thought that that fighting pointed to some big offensive by the Russians in Zaporozhye region. Again, it looks like Brian Beletic was right that the purpose of that advance was not to take Borekhov or Echov or any of these places, much less attack Zaporozhye itself. Rather, it was intended to um, advance Russian positions, create more of Simplicius the Thinker's crumple zones in advance of the offensive that the Ukrainians are expected to launch in this area. Anyway, um, there was a big strike on Orekhov. Um, Orekhov is a major assembly area for Ukrainian troops who are supposed to be participating in this offensive. And the Russians claim, they may be right, they may be wrong, I have no way of corroborating this one way or the other, that hundreds of Ukrainian troops, no doubt assigned to this offensive, were killed in this strike. So, what does Ukraine do? It's been playing what I think actually is a rather skillful game. They've been, first of all, saying that they don't want to launch the offensive yet because the weather conditions aren't right. We now have these somewhat terse, angry commentaries appearing in the Western media which says that the weather conditions are now optimal. So, you know, that argument has gone then we're told that Ukraine needs more weapons, that they are not fully stocked with all the weapons they need. And I think before people ridicule this, I would point out that this has worked well for Ukraine. The Ukrainians have been able to use this endless demand for more weapons to achieve two of the things they wanted. The first is to buy time, to delay this offensive as long as possible. The second is they have obtained more weapons. They obtained their tanks and infantry fighting vehicles back in the spring, in March. Of course, um, <laughs> that was in anticipation of an offensive that was supposed to happen on the 30th of April. But anyway, they've obtained these tanks and these infantry fighting vehicles. We know about the 30th of April date because it's there in the uh, Pentagon leaks, by the way. One of the documents of the Pentagon leaks tells us that that was the intended date for this offensive. Anyway, so they've obtained their tanks. They've obtained the infantry fighting vehicles. Obviously not in anything like the numbers that they said they wanted, but, you know, they've obtained them. Then... They said that they needed more shells. And, of course, the West is largely out of shells. Shell production in the United States and in Europe simply can't keep up with Ukrainian needs. But they've got more shells. The United States did this deal with South Korea. Um, South Korea was going to lend half a million shells to the United States. In reality, we learn from the Wall Street Journal that it simply passed these shells directly to Ukraine, which is where they were always intent intended to go. So half a million shells from South Korea, which is probably enough to sustain an offensive for several weeks. Of course, the Russians have been busy blowing up ammunition depots. They blew up a massive one in Pavlograd. They did another similar attack on another um, ammunition dump in Khmelnytsky. We don't know what the exact shell situation for Ukraine is. Um, but anyway, all of that was successfully achieved. Um, they did get their shells. 
presumably several thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of them are still left, uh, still there to launch this offensive when it has to be launched. And, of course, they've also held out for fighter jets, and they're going to get their fighter jets. Now, again, there's a lot of debate about when this is going to happen. So far, it's only training. Ukrainian pilots have been trained to fly these F-16s. Um, the suggestions that it could take a whole year before um, the infrastructure to service these F-16s in Poland and perhaps Romania uh, and in Ukraine itself is ready. There's lots of doubts about this. Stephen Bryan, by the way, well-known commentator, he's said that the only F-16s that Ukraine is going to get are the earlier A and B versions, um, which are the ones that the donating countries the Netherlands, Denmark, Belgium probably, are going to supply. He says that some of these F-16s are at the end of their useful lives, a bit like the MiG-29s that were supplied before. I think he's probably right about all of that, by the way. He says that the United States will not want to compromise the Azar radars of the later, more advanced F-16s by deploying them in Ukraine, and I think he's probably right about that too. Um, he also says that these F-16s are not going to make any fundamental difference to the course of the war, and I'm sure he's right about that also. And there's been discussion about what these F-16s are going to be used for. Some say they will be used to launch um, these missiles, storm, sh uh, storm Shadow missiles supplied by Britain, Ukraine is now asking for similar Taurus missiles from Germany. They're very similar, apparently, to the Storm Shadow. They fulfill the same role. They use the same kind of techniques and technologies. Anyway, um, these are going to be launched from the F-16s. Well, that is probably true, but it's important to say that Ukraine itself, it's talking about using these F-16s principally to provide air cover for its troops, which would mean that the F-16s would have to come close to the contact line, where, of course, they would be within the range of Russia's extremely advanced air defence system. And here I have to make an observation. We have been hearing very little over the last couple of days about Ukrainian use of the Storm Shadow missile system. Again, there was lots of expectations that this would be a game changer missile system. Um, the fact that the Russians claimed that they shot down seven of these missiles over the course of one day and that they were able to shoot down several Ukrainian aircraft that launched these missiles might be the reason. The reason, perhaps, why Ukraine is now asking Germany for Taurus missiles may be that the storm shadows have proved less effective than anticipated. And the other thing about the Taurus missile is it has a longer range than the storm shadow, which the Ukrainians might hope would put the launching aircraft out of reach of the Russian air defense systems, um, which are now, many of which are now forward deployed. There was a rather scary, at least I found it scary, report that one of the latest and most advanced Russian air defense systems, the S-350 Vityaz system, has now been deployed to the front lines and it appears to use some variation of AI technology because apparently it engaged and shot down Ukrainian targets without any human intervention at all. It did so entirely on automatic mode. Now, I'm not an expert on these things. I find that rather uh, alarming, <laughs> if it's true. But um, that's the kind of threat 
that F-16 fighter jets would be encountering if they came close to the Russian front lines in an effort to provide air cover for Ukrainian troops. But anyway, that seems to be what Ukraine is saying, and they're going to get their F-16s, but it may be that they were hoping to delay the launch of the offensive until these F-16s appear. But we've had now rather strong statements from American military officials, including President Biden himself. They're all saying that Ukraine doesn't need these F-16s. They can launch this offensive right away. It's got all the equipment and material and technology and machines and ammunition that it needs and the trained troops. They should launch that offensive now, not wait for the F-16s. And we've been told by people like General Milley and all kinds of other people in the United States, well, yes, we're going to give the Ukrainians the F-16s. They want the F-16s. We'll give them the F-16s. But it's not a game changer. It's not going to change anything very much on the battlefield. And of course, it's the fact that it's coming in the future is not a reason to delay this offensive now. So that begs the question of why? Why is there all this pressure on Ukraine to launch this offensive? Well, it could be that the Western powers do hope that this offensive will change things on the battlefield, that Ukraine will achieve some kind of breakthrough. It's also highly likely that the Western powers have come to the recognition for some time that their capacity to keep Ukraine going, this venture in Ukraine going for much longer, is starting to run down. There's been much commentary about this in the Western media, about how political will to sustain the war is flagging in the United States, how it may not be possible to keep this war going for very much longer, how the cost of keeping Ukraine supplied is something that US and European taxpayers are not prepared to meet. I don't take those arguments seriously. The real problem, as has been discussed many times by myself, by, by Brian Boletic, is capacity issues. Um, there's been, again, I want to repeat this, the best discussion so far of ammunition issues comes from Simplicius the Thinker. The Russians are now producing millions of shells a year. The West cannot. Its production is running far below what the Russians are achieving. The Russians are producing around 200,000 shells a month. The West can produce between 30 and 35,000 shells a month, which is insufficient even to meet Ukraine's current needs. They've managed to pull together ammunition from South Korea. They can't repeat this trick indefinitely. There's rumours, by the way, they've also managed to obtain some ammunition from Pakistan. They can't keep maintain this for very much longer. Eventually, this is going to all run down, and you can't keep the war going for very long. So clearly, there is this feeling that it's now or never. We have to launch this counteroffensive, especially before the Russians. The position that the Russians have in Ukraine becomes too strong to be reversed at all, which could be deeply troubling and embarrassing. So you launch this offensive now, hope that the Russians have not yet fully completed their preparations, have not fully consolidated. Launch this offensive. Keep your fingers crossed. Hope for the best. Hope that Ukraine can break through in some places, perhaps bring Crimea um, under threat, and then maybe seek some kind of negotiations on more favourable terms than those that you would have to accept. Now, maybe that's the plan, but I suspect that there is another factor 
at play too, which is the pressure from around the world is now growing to settle this war on what, to be frank, is increasingly looking like Russian terms. And there are rumours circulating that Li Hui, um, Xi Jinping's um, emissary, whose job it is to try to, who, who rather Xi Jinping has charged with trying to find a negotiated settlement to this war. Anyway, he apparently has been telling Western officials that the only way that this war can end is if Ukraine cedes the four regions, Kherson, Zaporozhye, Lugansk and Donetsk to Russia, accepts a huge demilitarized zone. I'll come to that in a moment. And, well, that's all the hints that we've received. And that may explain why Western officials are not only pushing Ukraine with this offensive, not only sending more weapons to Ukraine, but are coming up with these comments about the fact that they're not prepared to allow the war to become frozen, why they still want to see the war ended with Ukraine regaining all its territory. The reason is that for them, a negotiated tr settlement on these lines, brokered by China, is just about the worst possible outcome. Not only would China have positioned itself as the mediator, the arbiter of the affairs and borders of Europe, but it would be acting in a way that would have strengthened its own ally, Russia, and which would conceivably create a situation where whatever was left of Ukraine basically became essentially a satellite of the Eurasian states integrated into the Eurasian system led by China and to some extent Russia. Now, as to this demilitarized zone idea, there have been maps circulating on the Chinese internet which show a huge zone north of the four regions all along the Dnieper, including Kharkov, extending all the way to the Russian border. And whilst this zone would presumably remain jurisdictionally under Ukrainian control, Ukraine would have no troops there. And of course, the Russian military would be able to move in at any time. So this is a rather extraordinary thing. And um, the fact that the demilitarized zones are indeed under discussion, we know this because Kirill Budanov, no less, has actually confirmed that. He's talking about the need for demilitarized zones of 100 kilometers on each side of the front lines when they finally are stabilized. But, of course, he probably wouldn't agree to the loss of all these huge territories to this demilitarized zone, one where Ukraine would not be able to position its own troops. So this is a nightmare scenario for the West. Worse, actually, than a total Ukrainian defeat. And that's where we come back to um, Mikhail Galuzin, Deputy Foreign Minister Mikhail Galuzin's comment about how the West is pushing Ukraine to launch its counteroffensive in spite of all the risks of its catastrophic consequences for Ukraine and its resident, residents, um, showing that they firmly intend to continue the conflict with Russia until the last Ukrainian 
better an outright Ukrainian defeat from a Western geopolitical perspective than a diplomatic solution to the war like this. Now, there are some voices in the West which are saying, well, let's put aside ideas about total victory or total defeat. Let's try and think a little bit more creatively. And we don't want to accept this Chinese proposal. But in that case, we need to make realistic counter proposals of our own. And that figure from the past, that old monster, if I can call him that, Henry Kissinger, has, who's just celebrated his 100th birthday, by the way, has come along with his various ideas. Now, a lot of people have been focusing recently upon the fact that over the last few months, Henry Kissinger has been talking about the fact that once the war is over, Ukraine should be admitted straight away into NATO. Now, I've been thinking a lot about this because, of course, that directly contradicts what Henry Kissinger has been saying in the past, and to some extent still. Um, I think that Kissinger knows perfectly well that there are many European countries that do not want to see Ukraine in NATO, that this is not really an acceptable position uh, for many European states. Germany, apparently, and this is something that all German politicians appear to be united about, categorically rules it out. So does France. So the idea, I think, of Kissinger talking about this is to give himself cover for other ideas. And what he's talking about is Ukraine essentially conceding to the Russians Crimea and other territories. And he's just given an interview in which he said that. He also, by the way, has said in the same interview that he thinks that the promise of NATO entry for Ukraine made back in 2008 was a grave mistake and it was the one which led directly to the war. Well, I've called Kissinger an old monster. I don't take that back. Note, however, that he is effectively acknowledging that people like Jeffrey Sachs, who's just written a good article about this, which I discussed in a program recently, Jeffrey Sachs and others, um, going all the way back to George Kennan um, back in the 90s, who was critical of the whole concept of NATO eastward expansion. But anyway, Henry Kissinger, that old monster, he's coming out and saying that was a grave mistake then. He's not really explaining why he thinks admitting Ukraine into NATO now would somehow rectify that mistake. But as I said, he is saying that, as I said, I think in order to buy himself a hearing. But he comes back and says, we made that mistake then. We have to acknowledge that. We have to recognize, Ukraine has to recognize that you, Crimea is irretrievably lost and all of these other territories are that it's lost of the Russians. Well, it's going to have to concede at least some of them. So that's Kissinger. Now, as I said, I have no time for Kissinger as a human being whatsoever. I vividly remember his time as Richard Nixon's national security advisor and Secretary of State. Um, I remember all the things that he did at that time, but nobody has ever said that Kissinger was stupid. And this is at least an alternative to the Russian plan. It's not an alternative the Russians would accept. I am sure they will insist that NATO membership for Ukraine is something that should be categorically ruled out. But note again that we have 
comments now from various Western officials, heads of government, saying that after the war, Ukraine must enter NATO. I can't help but think that, again, the reason these comments are being made is not because these people agree with Kissinger, but again, precisely because they want to head off the idea of negotiations which might result in the kind of outcomes that both the Chinese and Kissinger are talking about. Negotiations which, to be frank, it would be difficult, at least for these people, to deny is some sort of a defeat. So what we have instead, I suspect, is some kind of plan after the counteroffensive is out of the way to try to negotiate some kind of freeze of the conflict, some sort of ceasefire. I discussed how Politico said that this would be a politically palatable option for the United States. But it's a freeze along the Korean lines, not what the Chinese are talking about, obviously, not what the Russians would accept, not even, I suspect, ultimately what Kissinger himself is thinking. But it's a freeze where what is left of Ukraine is ultimately integrated into the Western institutions, something which, as I've said already, is unacceptable to the Russians. So, an offensive is going to be launched. Men are going to die. Better, as I said, to go down to defeat than accept Chinese the Chinese terms. If you're going to freeze the war at all, do so in a way that integrates what's left of Ukraine into NATO and allows you to rearm it with F-16s and Abrams tanks and all of those things, as I said, all unacceptable to the Russians. But at worst, if the outcome is an outright Ukrainian defeat, we'll accept that. And in the meantime, in order to head off any ideas of negotiations, in order to keep Ukraine fighting and in the war, go on acceding to Ukraine's demands for weapons. Give them F-16s, give them Taurus missiles, give them Storm Shadow missiles, give them anything and everything that they ask for, though never in the quantities that Ukraine wants. They say, by the way, that they need 48 F-16s because, well, that isn't really realistic and you know it, and you know it that this isn't going to change the picture either. It is a cynical and immoral game, but it is the one that is being played with the Ukrainian people, and to a great extent, by the way, also with the Western public. I don't think it's going to work, but I suspect it's all that Western policymakers have. Now, I believe that General Austin... Lloyd Austin, the Defence Secretary, has now made certain comments. I haven't been able to track them down yet, but in them, allegedly, he appears to be coming very close to admitting that for the moment, Ukraine is losing the war. Why he thinks that the counteroffensive, if it happens, the supply of the F-16s, if they take place, which we're told isn't going to be a game changer, why that's going to change the outcome. I have no idea, but that's apparently where we're left. I don't think anybody in Western capitals any longer believes that the original plan, plan A, of defeating Russia by economic means, by imposing sanctions, I don't think anybody any longer believes that is going to happen. So, what we do instead is we propel Ukraine into a counteroffensive, which can only make its long-term position worse, keep its morale up, 
by agreeing to supply weapons, which we know are not going to achieve anything, and hope for the best, the best being some kind of freeze of the war on our terms, which will allow Ukraine, or what's left of it, to enter NATO. And if that fails, well, an outright defeat for Ukraine does have some attractions in the sense that at that point you can tell people in the West that the Russian bear is on the loose. You need to all huddle and gather together and consolidate your alliance and increase your defence spending and increase your dependence on the leadership in the United States to keep the bear at bay. That's, I think, the point we have reached at this point in this conflict. Well, thank you for joining me again today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again that you can find all our programmes on our various channels, Locals, Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey, Rockfin and Telegram. You can also support our work by going to our shop um, where you can find all the great things that we have, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all those great things. You can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Links as for our shop under this video. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please press like button and check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today. More from me soon.